just weeks before testifying at a criminal trial. One of the key witnesses, a brilliant research scientist, was murdered. For 15 years, there were many suspicions, but little proof. Ironically, advances in the very research the victim had been working on helped nail her killer. When you ask friends and colleagues about Helena Greenwood, you hear words like brilliant, quiet, honest, and a hard worker. Helena earned a PhD in microbiology and was an executive in the biotech industry. She not only was an excellent scientist, but she had marketing skills. And those two things often are not concurrent. Helena was very forward thinking especially looking at technology. But she also knew the power that technology by itself doesn't market a product. Basically, it's the human need. If there's a human need, there's a product that's required. Helena and her husband, Roger, a landscape designer, lived in Atherton, a quiet suburb outside San Francisco. Our story begins on a Saturday night in April of 1984, when Roger was out of town on a business trip. In the middle of the night, a man suddenly appeared in Helena's bedroom and threatened to kill her. Helena was sexually assaulted, then robbed, before the assailant made his getaway. Dr. Greenwood described her assailant as being fairly tall, slender, athletic, with a complexion perhaps of uh, part half black or Hispanic person, a olive com complexion. She couldn't see his face because he had a hooded sweatshirt pulled up so that only his eyes showed. The assailant entered the home through a kitchen window. But it was Helena's friend who found a key piece of evidence that police had overlooked. Outside on the deck near the kitchen window was a teapot from Helena's kitchen. Fortunately, the friend had the good sense not to touch it. That teapot was taken into evidence, taken to the crime lab, and fingerprints were developed. Imagine the teapot. There were three fingerprints in this position as though someone had picked up the teapot from the windowsill and placed it on the deck. Helena told police she made tea before going to bed, then placed the teapot on the windowsill. It appeared the assailant moved it before crawling through the window. Unfortunately, the fingerprints didn't match any on file with the police department. With no other leads, the case went unsolved until one year later. A man was arrested while exposing himself to a 12-year-old girl outside an apartment in Belmont, California. That suspect was David Paul Frediani. Belmont was only seven miles from Helena's home. The suspect, David Paul Fridiani, was a 42-year-old accountant with no prior arrests. Since Fridiani resembled the man Helena described, police compared his fingerprints to those found on Helena's teapot. They matched. One of the things I asked him was, he had denied even being involved in the initial sexual assault against Mrs. Greenwood. And I remember asking him, uh, you never assaulted this woman? He says, no, I never did any of that. They then told him, we have your fingerprints. At that point, according to Detective Chaput, Frediani took a deep breath, let it out, began trembling. He could actually see his chest moving in and out and made a statement to the effect as, I was really drunk when I did those things. <laughs> 
he then asked for a lawyer and refused to make any more statements. At the preliminary hearing, where both Helena and Frediani were present, she was asked if she could identify him, and she couldn't, not positively. And out of that arises one of the great mysteries of this whole case. But the fingerprints on the teapot were all the prosecution needed, so the case headed to trial. Sadly, Helena Greenwood didn't live long enough to testify in court. While her sexual assault case was pending, Helena Greenwood and her husband Roger moved from San Francisco to San Diego. She took a new job with Gen Probe, a biomedical research firm that was looking for ways to diagnose disease through DNA. It would be more specific or more accurate. It would also allow the testing to be more rapid, cutting down tests from that would take sometimes weeks just to days, or things that would take days, just down to minutes. One morning before work, Helena was at home on the phone, making last minute preparations for an important company meeting. Helena was very prompt. She would always come in at nine o'clock. But on this day, she never arrived. Coworker Sam Morishima had a feeling that something was terribly wrong because she would have at least called. And again, she was very precise on her arrival at Genpro, being at nine, especially if she had a meeting with someone. Coworkers called Helena's husband at work. He immediately drove home and found the front gate locked. When he peered over the fence, he saw his wife's body. Roger was in total shock. And he first called Genpro. He didn't call the police, he called Genpro. That shows how disoriented he was. We rushed down to, to the house. The police tapes were up. They wouldn't let us through the gate. But you knew that it, just from the talk that was going on, that Helena was assaulted uh, right behind that gate door in the courtyard. The crime scene appeared to be staged. It had the earmarks of a robbery, but no money was missing from Helena's wallet. You had her purse that was strewn about. They preserved all of that for fingerprints or other evidence, um, of which unfortunately there, there were none. There was no physical evidence left. Uh, obviously he wore gloves. I mean, one safely can assume that, I guess. And it was clear that Helena valiantly fought her attacker. This woman put up a hellacious fight. Obviously, it was evidenced by the fact that her fingernails were actually, two of them were found at the scene. She had broken them off while scratching this person. At the autopsy, the medical examiner discovered petechial hemorrhages in Helena's eyes, an indication of strangulation. There were no signs of sexual assault. But under Helena's fingernails were tiny traces of what appeared to be blood. Unfortunately, the sample was too small for forensic analysis. I mean, what comes to mind when, when there's a bizarre murder, you know, a strangulation in broad daylight? You think marital trouble, you think crime, you think drugs. I mean, Helen never got within a thousand miles of any of those things. And that simply deepened the mystery. Helena's husband, Roger, was the first person police interviewed. He was just so mad at the police uh, at, at the time because he was just, they were accusing, I mean, he was a suspect and he was just saying, he says, he says, why are they, you know, doing this to me? Whenever a woman is killed, the prime suspect is generally the husband. And statistically, that bears out. Most women who are killed are killed by someone well known to them. Uh, usually a romantic interest, and the husband is often the, the, the perpetrator. Roger said he left home at 8 a.m. and was at work at the time of his wife's murder, around 9 a.m. Records indicated Helena had been on the telephone until 9 a.m., about the time a neighbor heard a commotion. 
One man who lived next door said at about nine o'clock when he was shaving, he thought he heard a, a human, you know, a, an abrupt human cry, but who knows? When police confirmed Roger was at work 40 minutes away at that time, he was eliminated as a suspect. Helena's murder also meant that she would never testify at the sexual assault trial back in San Francisco. I got a call from Roger Franklin, who was Dr. Greenwood's husband. Roger told me that his wife had been murdered in San Diego, the San Diego area, where they had moved after uh, the sexual assault. That was a sickening moment because um, he also told me that her purse was found near her body, her car keys were there, her credit cards were there. It didn't appear that there had been a robbery. David Paul Frediani, the man accused of Helena's sexual assault, had been out on bail at the time of Helena's murder, but insisted he was 500 miles away in San Francisco. Investigators were naturally suspicious. He was the only person who conceivably had a motive for doing this. The prosecutor refused to drop the sexual assault charges against him. But everyone wondered whether the prosecutor would ever get a conviction now that his witness was dead. Just three weeks before she was scheduled to testify in her sexual assault trial, Helena Greenwood was murdered in her front yard. David Paul Frediani went on trial as scheduled for Helena's sexual assault. Prosecutors had his fingerprints on Helena's teapot, and they also found serological evidence. We also presented evidence that the semen on the pillowcase in Helena Greenwood's bedroom, first, that it was semen, second, that it was from a type O individual who was a secretor, and that a PGM type, phosphoglucomutase of one plus, all matched Frediani's ABO type. DNA testing in 1985 was still in its infancy. At the last minute, when faced with the fingerprint and serological evidence, Frediani pleaded no contest to the assault and was sentenced to five years in prison. But Frediani said he was innocent of her murder. They knew who killed Helena Greenwood, and they knew it was David Paul Frediani, but they couldn't prove it. Eventually, Helena Greenwood's murder was relegated to San Diego County's cold case files and forgotten. Over the next several years, Helena's parents died. Her husband, Roger, developed cancer, and he too passed away. And who is there to mourn for Helena? Very few and growing fewer. And Jen Probe went about the work Helena had been pursuing before her death, looking for ways to use new DNA technology for quicker, faster medical diagnoses. David Frediani served only three years of his five-year sentence and was released he returned to his accounting practice. This is a very egotistical, self-centered, obviously sociopathic person. Hey, I just got away with murder, you know? Uh, and his life went on and he prospered. And that's where the case stood for another 10 years, until investigators in San Diego's cold case unit decided to take a second look at Helena Greenwood's murder. And deep in Helena's file was a piece of information that immediately caught investigators' attention. Seven days before Helena's murder, David Paul Frediani was involved in a minor traffic accident in Southern California, not far from Helena's home. The defendant had no business being in Southern California. We knew he knew she lived down here, although we didn't know how he had that information. But it just seemed a little bit strange that he's awaiting trial, he lives in San Francisco, and he takes a trip down to Southern California. 
As detectives looked through the evidence, they noted there was a tiny speck of blood under Helena's fingernail, at the time far too small for DNA testing. Had forensic science advanced to the point that it could identify a speck of blood almost too small to see. For 13 years, the murder of biotech research scientist Helena Greenwood went unsolved. The medical examiner found what looked to be blood under one of her fingernails. At the time, it was far too small for DNA analysis. By 1998, however, work that Gen Probe and scientists like Helena Greenwood had been working on led to new developments in DNA testing. One of the most important was polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, which enabled scientists to copy minute DNA samples until they were large enough to test. Polymerase chain reaction allows you to make a geometrically increasing number of copies where you start with one, after one round of PCR, you end up with two, and then four, and then eight, and so on. The big advantage of PCR for forensic work is that it is so sensitive. A very small amount of DNA can yield a very large amount of information. It's a fortunate thing that they didn't try to test it at the time, because as you test uh, biological material, it, it, it's destroyed. And had they, at the time of Helena's autopsy, tested that material, they would have found nothing, and the material would have been destroyed. When the biological material from Helena's fingernails was tested using PCR, scientists made an important finding. On some of the fingernail clippings, they found only DNA that was consistent with Dr. Greenwood's. And on one of the clippings, they found DNA that was essentially pure, it was not from Dr. Greenwood at all. And that's when they got very interested because, of course, the possibility is that that's the perpetrator's DNA. And investigators found even more evidence on Helena's clothing. On her nylon stockings were grab marks, so they decided to test that area for microscopic traces of blood and found some. The DNA from Helena's fingernail and stockings was compared to a blood sample from David Fridiani. And here are the numbers. The odds that the DNA under Helena's fingernail and stockings was someone other than David Fridiani's was one in 23 billion. He could hardly believe it when police arrested him. Mr. Fridiani came out of his house and began walking to his car. And that's when uh, we approached him and placed him under arrest. His reaction was all the color just rushed from his face. He turned white. I think he knew at that point that uh, he wasn't going to be looking over his shoulder anymore. It was over. And uh, great satisfaction for us. David Paul Fridiani was charged with first degree murder. One of the tragedies, of many tragedies in this case, is that Roger never lived to hear that Frediani, who he knew, had done the murder. He never lived to hear that the San Diego authorities were able to identify Mr. Frediani as the murderer. Prosecutors believe Frediani murdered Helena in the mistaken belief that her death would end the sexual assault case against him. He wasn't smart enough to understand that just because he killed Mrs. Greenwood, that her preliminary testimony was still going to be used. He didn't realize that was, that was the error in his plan. He drove 500 miles from his home in San Francisco to Helena's home in San Diego to stalk the couple and learn their schedules. His first mistake was getting into a car accident a few days before the murder, proof that he was in San Diego before the crime. Fridiani learned that Roger left for work every morning around 8 a.m., about an hour before Helena. Prosecutors believe Fridiani waited for Helena outside her front gate 
He was wearing gloves to avoid leaving fingerprints like he did when he assaulted Helena a year earlier. When he heard Helena close the front door, he made his move. Fridiani probably believed the gloves would protect him and didn't realize he left crucial forensic evidence behind. Ironically, it was Helena who grabbed it. I can only imagine what was going through Helena's mind that this man that who assaulted her is obviously coming to do harm to her. Maybe it's just a little too much to think, but she scratched the heck out of this guy. We know she, we know she did. I almost wonder, like, hey, I'm going to leave some evidence behind to show who my killer was. I may not survive this, but by God, I'm going to leave something behind to tell you who killed me. And I think this is what happened in this case. At the trial, under cross-examination, Fridiani admitted to the sexual assault, but he did not confess to her murder. Regardless, he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. We expect victims to testify, and that's what Helena Greenwood did. She testified against the defendant at the preliminary examination, and then he tracked her down and he killed her. And no conviction is justice for what happened to her. But ironically, the science that she was working on, in fact, helped put away her killer.